All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to the latest installment of the uh, Heart Center Weekly Rounds. Uh, this is uh, the third installment of uh, a lecture series that has been put together by Dr. Hibachek. Uh, Yaro is, uh, as everyone knows, uh, is an interventional cardiologist of uh, excellent repute at the uh, Heart Center, and he's been kind enough to put together three talks. The first one was looking at uh, diagnostic modalities in the cath lab, going beyond just simply looking at an angiogram and making an assessment of coronary lesions. Uh, talked about IVIS and FFR, IFR, RFR, so that was excellent. And then the second talk was really looking at the management of calcified lesions in the cath lab, looking specifically at the role of uh, the rotor blader and uh, more, uh, more recent technology in the form of the IVL, which is the intravascular lithotripsy. Uh, which we actually just used last week. So uh, the shockwave technology. His last talk, um, which I think is a perfect kind of uh, end cap uh, to this series is looking at uh, the whole notion of CHIP, uh, which is the uh, complex high-risk intervention uh, patient um, and looking at PCI and the role really for a combined approach in these patients, uh, combining the, the efforts of, I would say surgery and interventional cardiology are the most obvious, but also the clinical cardiologist uh, could be considered as well. Yaro, thank you so much for having done these. Um, and uh, we really do appreciate it uh, uh, from the surgical side, but I think for everyone uh, who attends these, uh, we are all very grateful. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Ansar. I'm happy to be here yet again. Eventually we'll get tired of me. Uh, so let's talk about the CHIP and CHIP PCI. So what is the CHIP? Stands for Complex High-Risk Indicated Patients. There are multiple explanations for acronym, but this is probably the best uh, description of it. And despite many people are wondering why the hell we're trying to do the CHIP, uh, we're doing CHIP cases or high-risk patients since uh, 1980s. That time, we just didn't call it CHIP. We're calling them CHIP since uh, 2016, 17, when the white paper came out. And prior 2000, at least, uh, and 10, uh, all these high-risk patients were more on a last resort palliative procedure like uh, with extremely high mortality. So give you the perspective again, why we're talking about it in 2020. This is timeline of uh, what happened since 90s to today in the cath lab. And what did we do? Major components focusing on a chip is that we as an interventional group started to sub, 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 sub specializing. So we all do certain things to contribute to achieve the same result. And uh, this high risk complex patient, whether it's on a valve or whether it's the coronaries require sub specialization. So we get the best results. CHIP here started in about 2009 when we did first PCI on Impala. Subsequently, we were wandering more into the complex anatomy and using hemodynamics and imaging. Uh, in 2013, we introduced CTO program or complex PCI program and slowly ventured into the shock with so-called shock team, which was not really established at the time, but we were starting to use more and more LV support. Uh, last year, we added the ROTA. This year, we wrote it IVL, as we discussed last time. And then this year, we came up with a official chip program which combine all of above and especially with uh, now interest of in the surgical group or with to help with uh, LV support for these complex patients uh, essentially further advance the program so we can provide the treatment for no option patient such as a week ago we did uh, occluded right severely calcified left main in patient with severe aortic stenosis which single inflation of the balloon would lead to death immediately while the patient survived the procedure without any problems. ECMO got him through the procedure. He was decannulated and he did fine. And now he will be assessed for TAVI in a later day. That's not where the progress stops. Uh, further forward, especially from the CHIP perspective, alternative access uh, is being considered and potentially uh, introduced, which is transcable, axillary, even carotid uh, approach to be introduced for those people that we have a hard time getting access. However, this is hope it will happen rather than it's happening right now. 
So over last decade, we're starting to do not only the patient that we did in the 80s and consider them very high risk, but even new patient, as I mentioned, the guy, person with uh, aortic stenosis and critical left main that we would never, ever even consider bringing to the cath lab. So what it incorporates to be high risk but indicated patient, there are three major components, which is patient comorbidities, his LV uh, function and hemodynamics, and then coronary anatomy consideration. Doing all this cannot be done by one, by one person. Starts with general cardiologist, CCU specialist, ICU specialist, interventionalist, structural heart disease specialist, meaning TAVI, mitral people, cardiac surgeon, electrophysiologist, cardiac anesthesiologist, interventional radiologist that are helping us with the access and creating the routes to get to the heart, perfusionists and the nurses that have interest in doing these complex procedures. So let's break it down. Comorbidities, major ones is peripheral vascular disease, diabetes and stage renal failure and acute coronary syndrome, especially in a non-STEMI. Hemodynamic and LV function wise, pretty straightforward, the EF and elevated LVDP. And from anatomical perspectives, a long lesion, calcified lesion, occluded vessels, left main, multivessel instant restenosis. So on th this diagram was created by the interventional cardiologists. So they never considered surgical component, which our surgical co uh, colleague put on a table, which is essentially the lung abnormalities that prevent them to effectively get the patients off the ventilator post bypass surgery, severe pulmonary hypertension, frailty, inability to mobilize post or porcelain and aorta, left subclavian stenosis, all these factors making the patient high risk, whether it's from the surgical or interventional. Uh, as I said, this is multi-team approach. Therefore, before we doing the revascularization on this high risk patient, we need to optimize their medical therapy in case medical therapy will make them asymptomatic. Uh, which is heart and rhythm uh, uh, rate and rhythm control, preload and afterload management, being sure that we're perfusing their organs, no point opening the vessel if the patient dies of the brain ischemia, appropriate do antipel therapy from PCI perspective, addressing contributing factors, which is anemia, hypoxia, infection, pain, because all these factors negatively affect their long-term outcome, even if we revascularize them properly, whichever mode we choose. And most importantly, it's determining goals of treatment. Just because patient has high-risk calcified left main occluded right and severe aortic stenosis, doesn't mean that he needs to be address if he has underlying metastatic pancreatic cancer with survival of one to two months, putting him through everything that we could would be an appropriate medical treatment. So patient as the whole needs to be considered before we proceed. Hemodynamics outside of just using the LVDP, EF assessment, using the swan gun scatter, estimating RV and LV function, and considering the mechanical circulatory support is absolutely crucial. And with, with respect to coronary anatomy, uh, assessing uh, uh, lesions that truly need to be addressed and how they need to be prepared is important. Regarding the lesions, there is no 80% and 80% that are the same. It can be type A lesion, which is very simple, to type C, which is complex, and on top of that, you have occluded vessel, then again can go from easy to very difficult, depends on JCTO score and how uh, we're able to open them. Since this is a huge variety of patients and multiple factors are considered, uh, we need to objectify the risk. We have multiple clinical and geographic and surgical scores that we can calculate the mortality and periprocedural MACE. Unfortunately, these are developed to estimate low degree of risk, which is less than 10%. And whenever it's above 10%, they're becoming uh, less able to discriminate and estimate the risk. CHIP patients are often very high risk in a range over 50%. Just uh, on mark, mortality of the regular PCI is 0.1%. When you compare it to mortality of 40, 50%, you have four to 500 higher chance of dying with the procedure. So these are, none of these are quote unquote easy eh? and a lot of discussions going in. Considering we don't have any tools objectively assess the art of the medicine is extremely crucial. And that's what, again, this multi, uh, 
uh, team with multiple experts is absolutely crucial to determine what is the best solution for the patient. So after all of us sit together and had multiple discussion and discuss uh, that PCI is the best option, then we get the so-called CHIP PCI, which has about five basic principles. First one is KISS principle, keep it simple, that we trying to simplify procedures as much as we can by IFR, FFR, IVAS, OCT that we discussed a few weeks back. Uh, second one is don't beat your head against the wall, i.e. dealing with a calcified lesion and chronic, uh, chronic occlusions. Three is maximize the success uh, by avoiding the routine, just because we're doing over 80% of the radial doesn't mean everybody has to be done radially. Uh, just because we're doing everything through a six French sheath to minimize bleeding doesn't mean that that actually improves our access, uh, which is then subsequently specialized to the patient. Fourth, uh, strongly consider mechanical uh, circulatory support for these patients. And uh, third and the last one is don't be a hero, don't put a cowboy head on and claim that it's me and me only that can do this because that only gets us in a trouble. Big picture, uh, the more complex and high risk patient we attempt and perform the procedure successfully, more grateful and humble we should be that we actually succeeded because despite all we're trying to do, despite that we're trying to do our best, doesn't mean that the outcome is what we want. Uh, so let's go through all the principles that I mentioned before. So the KISS principle, we were discussing FFR, IFR, RFR, and intravascular imaging, IVAS and OCT, to help us uh, choose the right lesion and the right outcome. Very briefly, I refresh your memory that we're trying to use the optimal threshold uh, below which revascularization make a sense and actually improve patient outcome irrespective of how bad lesion looks uh, on an angiogram. And if you're intervening on these lesions that have, they are above the threshold, I don't need to be done, patient outcome gets worse. So treat only lesion that needs to be done and treat the ones that provide the best benefit. A uh, quick slide about the FFR. There's ischemic threshold and clinical threshold. So it's me in the chip, more we concerning about the ischemic threshold of 0.75 to be sure that we're dealing with the lesion that's gonna help the patient. In IFR and RFR world, it's 0.85 and clinical benefit in 0.89. We discussed that for 20 minutes last time. And then we're using intracoronary imaging to be sure that we plan procedure properly, assessing calcium size of the vessel. And then once the stent is deployed, we optimize that stent so we don't uh, run into uh, acute, subacute, and long-term complication of the standing procedure. Next principle is don't beat your head against the wall, i.e. dealing with the calcium. Those who uh, were present or saw the presentation last time. We're trying to achieve panel A and B nicely expanded stand and avoid the C scenario when after the stand deployment, we have still significant stenosis with really under expanded stand, which didn't really help the patient. We have multiple technologies that we discussed from NC balloons to rotational atherectomy and IVL. For simplicity, rota using for non-crossable, IVL for non-dilatable lesions. Don't beat your head against the wall. The CTO component is essentially vessel is occluded for more than three months, often for years, and causing significant problem. We can uh, address it, so-called hybrid CTO PCI that using integrate approach, meaning going with the flow of the blood uh, as the access versus retrograde going against the blood uh, flow, and we're using multiple techniques, multiple wires. For simplicity, we're using integrate approach, retrograde approach, and dissection re-entry, trying to get from subintimal space to the true lumen to establish uh, the connection above and beyond lesion from true lumen to true lumen. To achieve that, there is totally different uh, toolbox compared to regular PCI from different wires, different microcatheters, uh, crossbow stingray system, which is uh, dissection re-entry, different balloons, and using stent selectively. If there is significant calcium, again, we use ROTA or IVL. This is how the CTO can, uh, procedure looks like somewhere just before the stent deployment, we're using two catheters. We have the wire that went through the left system, through the septal, 
retrograde through the into the RCA, back to the RCA integrated guide and out. So this particular wire goes from right radial all the way through the heart, through the septum and back out through the right groin. And uh, then we can use it as a rail. You can see the microcatheter is here and this is the stent to be deployed. Next is uh, mechanical circulatory support. In the old days, we only had intraortic balloon pump. Uh, since 2009, we had access to Impala and ECMO have been here for years, but now more frequently, especially with uh, Dr. White arrival, we're using it in a cath lab. Each modality has a different hemodynamic effect and support. Uh, this is diagram for me because I can't remember complex stuff. So balloon pump is about half a liter. Impala CP is about three liters to three and a half liters and ECMO can provide full support up to seven liters. When do we use the uh, mechanical circulatory support? There's no really clear data. This is the Washington State uh, University protocol uh, that you score each factor uh, and you get final total score, which determines whether you unlikely to need support if it's less than two, you should strongly consider support if it's three and definitely use the support if it's more than four. But when you, for those who understand statistics, see statistics of 0.64, it's only slightly better than flipping the coin, which would be C statistic of 50.5. Last but not least is don't be a hero and avoid me and me only, means I am the best one, whoever is saying it, and uh, can do it. Uh, based on the UK chip research definition of the uh, chip procedure, which have first six component, six components and I added another seven and eight, uh, they find out that if the single operator doing the procedure, which is the yellow line, mortality steadily uh, increasing, essentially doubling with every single factor you add. So going from zero, which would be regular PCI to one chip factor, two or three, up to 10% with three factors. If you include the body operator, means there are two interventionists doing the procedure. Again, not the dressing involvement of the surgeon, anesthesiologist, et cetera, which might have even a more beneficial effect. You essentially the halving the, mortal, uh, halving the mortality of the, of the procedure. So you go from 10% to 5% simply by adding another eyes, pair of eyes, hands, and another brain. What does it mean, you know, going from chip one factor versus three uh, or four. So it goes from zero, that was easy. We actually have a button in a cath lab that you can press, it's a regular PCI. The chip that it's one or two, have one or two, which many of us interventional is doing. It was so-called, that would be PCI that was, you come out and said that was not easy, which compound about 95% of all cases. As the number of the factors increasing, you getting into the procedure, why did I try this? And I will never ever do it again, cases, which then uh, are relatively uh, sm uh, in small number that we're doing. But again, by involving the surgeon, surgeons supporting us hemodynamically significantly improve our success rate. So we're back at the beginning. CHIP is not about one particular part, it's patient as the whole. Not one person can do this. It's a whole play out of the physician, nurses, technicians, everybody that is involved in patient care before, during, and after the procedure is very important and integral part. Cath lab uh, directly has its own challenges to dealing with the CHIP team. How bad is the chip or how often? Let me put it in the numbers. So you see that the total number of chip cases currently is about 150 a year, which represents about 3.5% of all cases. Uh, CTO, we're doing about 20. Rota, we're doing about 30. IVL, about five. And I'm only including those that are high risk patients. Uh, IVL starting to have higher and higher penetration for quote unquote simple procedures. Technically complex PCI and involvement of, uh, and use of Impala and ECMO totally come to those 150. For uh, comparison, uh, hemodynamics and intravascular imaging 
comp uh, uh, is 10 to 12 percent, and that's considered low low uh, frequency. So finally, chip is not new. We're doing it since 1980s. Since 2009, we're trying to move from very high risk mortality procedures with low success rate, with introducing all the new technology and collaboration into high success rate procedures with lo relatively low mortality because they will never be low mortality procedures. The only way we can achieve that is via multidisciplinary and specialized team approach. What in my world means all of us working together and letting the best person to do the job and any specific step of the patient journey from the presentation, hopefully to discharge. Thank you all for your contribution to CHIP. Thanks, Yaro, that's fantastic. Um, I'm just going to uh, unshare your, maybe I'll just get you to unshare yours. Here we go, I'll just stop your sharing, perfect. Awesome. All right. Uh, well, once again, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great overview. And I think, uh, I think we can all attest uh, from, uh, from the surgeon standpoint, but as well as uh, just really from a heart center perspective that the game has changed uh, with respect to high risk uh, PCI intervention. And, and I thought, you know, one of the questions that came through on the chat uh, was about just the, the, you know, the predicted volumes for ECMO guided or ECMO supported PCI. And um, in the in the in the chip setting, obviously, and and I think you answered that question, saying about ten to fifteen a year is what you're anticipating, uh, or at least what you've seen. And and I think you know, I think we all know that this is an evolving target, and you know, it may it may grow as as we get more comfortable with the concept of of using concomitant ECMO. And I thought to that effect, maybe just before we um, we we get into a, another question from Ricardo. Uh, Chris, can I get you to speak just briefly about uh, just the whole uh, the whole process of using ECMO in these patients and what's involved and and uh, what's your sort of typical case? Yeah, it's a great talk, Yaro. Thanks very much. Um, I, I think to start, what is very unique here is the very good working relationship between uh, you know the interventional cardiology program the our cardiac surgery program and the general cardiology program. Um, and so I think for that reason, we've probably um, tended to, to use ECMO more versus Impella here, uh, you know, as this program has, has evolved. And I think that's for a few reasons. One, the patients we've done, you know, either had significant aortic stenosis or significant vascular assets issues where Impella would have been a challenge to begin with, but two, um, you know, the, the simplicity and low cost of, of doing this with ECMO has also been an appealing um, component of it, you know, a $1,500 circuit versus a $15,000 pump. Um, and then three, the added benefit of, you know, when you talk about a critical AS and critical left main disease, uh, while an impella provides LV support, if the patient fibrillates, um, you're not going to get sufficient flow with just LV support with an impella in the LV. Um, not to mention that you can't get the impella across the stenotic aortic valve to begin with. So I think with full VA ECMO support, um, you provide biventricular support and pulmonary support so that even if they fibrillate, um, they're fine and you're not having to initiate chest compressions while you're trying to get their coronaries open. So I think for us, it's been a simple, easily deployed uh, modality of support that provides, um, you know, complete hemodynamic and pulmonary support and really then simplifies the job for, for the interventional program to then just worry about the coronaries. Um, the downside is it does require a little more personnel and, in, and planning to execute because uh, we just have to coordinate our schedules together, which so far hasn't been uh, too much of a challenge, but is an additional consideration. In terms of how you know, we, we plan this. The biggest question is 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 uh, where we cannulate and how we cannulate. One patient, because of horrible peripheral vascular disease, we um, cannulated axillary for arterial access and, and femoral venous, which uh, worked quite well. The others have all been uh, fem-fem ECMO, despite, you know, calcified femoral vessels and things. Um, so I think the biggest question from the surgical side is, 
is what does their peripheral vasculature look like and how can we plan their cannulation to minimize the risk of stroke and dissection. Um, the patients we've done so far, Yaro can speak to this also, but um, have really been people who are not surgical candidates, clearly due to advanced stage comorbidities, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have, have uh, all kind of had, a, these people have been presented at our combined rounds on Wednesday morning. And uh, I feel like have had a good consensus from the group that this is the best, the best way forward. Um, so we, you know, in general, the patient comes into the cath lab, um, the surgical team starts and, you know, this involves the same cannulation approach we do to, you know, any kind of shock patient in general requiring ECMO. So it's a, um, we do this via cut down and a purse string and femoral artery and vein um, which really then simplifies the decannulation and minimizes the risk of, of um, cannulation complications in my mind, uh, with the exception of if we need to do an axillary approach and that involves a little more work. Um, and then I think to Ricardo's question, all these patients have come through their procedure without stroke, um, technical success from a PCI perspective and uh, tend to be discharged uh, quite quickly um, post-operatively, we have had one take back for um, bleeding in the uh, in the groin um, of the ones we've done so far. Um, I'm not sure if Yaro has anything else to add uh, in that regard in terms of how these patients have done, but all of them I've seen have been discharged from uh, uh, from CCU quite quickly. So if I can comment on the risk uh, and our outcome since 2013 when we started doing complex PCI and CTO we had one mortality which was the patient he was about to go on palliative care and it was last resort unfortunately he passed uh, and that was unsuccessful procedure uh, then uh, we have few periprocedural MIs, especially when we're dealing with a calcified uh, lesion, which would be in a range of about 7 to 10% uh, with CK rise uh, close to 500, but we didn't have one over 1,000, so we didn't have a large, large periprocedural MIs. And as Chris said, majority of these patients come in the evening, then they want to go home because they feel so great and they don't understand why they want to keep them extra day, uh, despite a very high risk, uh, high risk procedure that they just uh, had and it happened on multiple occasions. So, so far we have very low periprocedural mortality. We have very small and acceptable periprocedural MI, uh, significant clinical improvement. Unfortunately, we don't have long-term follow-up, which we will try to follow via the uh, approach once we get access to our own data. That's great, Garo. Thanks so much. I think this is uh, this is a great example of the uh, the as as Chris alluded to the collaboration that exists within the Heart Center and why it is that we're able to get the results that we uh, have gotten. And uh, kudos to you and your team, uh, as well as to the Heart Center as a whole for yet another excellent accomplishment. Um, next week, uh, we're, uh, Dr. Michel Dastou from the uh, Georges Dumont Hospital will be talking to us about the ischemia trial, but more specifically ischemia trial from the perspective of a cardiologist uh, at a non-surgical center, I think would be a, a, a sort of a valuable insight uh, to provide. So we're looking forward to that session on the 25th of November. Um, please look at our YouTube channel. All the talks have been updated as of the most recent talk from last week. And then of course, uh, today's talk from Yara will also be uh, uploaded shortly in the next few days. So once again, thank you very much for everyone. Uh, participating and all, and um, look forward to uh, seeing you all next week. Thank you, Yaro. Thank you.